John, for most of this season, uh, we assumed Alex Anthopoulos' team would be playing at least in the NLCS. They're not. They were surprised and knocked out for the second straight year by the Phillies. But he's nice enough to join us on the show. Yes, a great guest. We appreciate him coming on at a difficult time for him. I, they were the best team in the regular season. There was no question about it. They tied the home run record. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether he thinks the uh, playoff format needs to be changed or something they did wrong that uh, really did them in. We'll ask him about all that uh, and his team, what they'll be doing this offseason. We'll also talk about the opening GM job in Boston, the suddenly open GM job in Miami because Kim Ang is out. And John and I will discuss the playoffs a little bit. We'll play hit and error at the end if you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. John, we're doing this from uh, hotel rooms. Uh, you're still in Philadelphia. You're going to travel later today uh, to Arizona. I'm in Arlington, Texas. Uh, we're both awaiting game threes, you in the NL. Uh, I'm in the uh, AL. Uh, we've played about two and a half rounds of the playoffs, uh, and we have two dominant teams at this point. The Rangers haven't lost the game when we're having this conversation, John. The Phillies have lost once, but have actually looked more awesome even than the Rangers. Uh, I wonder, just big picture-wise, what 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 you've thought of this postseason to date? Well, there have been a lot of blowouts, the series and the games. Uh, the first round was four sweeps. Not that unusual with two two games winning the sweep, but still... Uh, we haven't had a lot of close contests. I mean, Philly has just been dominant. The one game they lost, they had the 4 nothing lead. They lost at the end with that great catch by Harris, and then Bryce Harper doubled off. But, uh, you know, I'm here now. They've been amazing, 10 nothing, and that was really set it. They won the first game 5-3, didn't seem that close. Six solo home runs. I mean, if the home runs come with men on base, they're really blowouts in game one as well as two. Uh, Philly looks amazing to me, and uh, – Everything's breaking right for them now. You know, that can switch in a moment's notice. But to me, they look like the best team. Yeah, we've had two dominant teams, as I mentioned, uh, John. Uh, we're, we're watching this. I, as I think big picture about this, if this is where we're heading, uh, a World Series between the Phillies and the Rangers, which I would assume is what would make MLB happy with those being probably the two largest markets, Dallas and Philadelphia being left. And I think a ton of interesting storylines. I do wonder, look, we're not completely over this battle between uh, old style scout and analytic. We would have two kind of like old fashioned uh, manager front office situations, uh, Dave Dombrowski and Rob Thompson, uh, Bruce Bochy. And though Chris Young is is a no pun intended, relatively young general manager, I think his feel is something and it's it's something I've been thinking about a lot. This offseason, we cover baseball in New York, primarily, John, and those two teams spend a lot of money. I think what they lack is feel. And I think Dave Dombrowski and Chris Young have feel. I think everyone's going to run to say, oh, spend money in free agency, because these two teams certainly have gone to the top of the market these last two off seasons. But it's one thing to spend it, and it's another thing to spend it with feel on the right players. And I feel Dave Dombrowski has been doing that for about a quarter of a century, and Chris Young albeit with the Jacob deGrom situation not going well, has generally done it very well so far in Texas. Yeah, I mean, Chris Young is a shorter track record, obviously very, very good to this point. But um, Dombrowski, who I wrote about the other day, I mean, you know, it's a copycat league. Maybe there'll be some owners and some teams that are switching a little bit back toward old school, toward scouting. Uh, you know, he mentioned scouting first when he talked about uh, how he decides to acquire which players that he acquires. He did mention analytics, medical. Uh, he mentioned a number of variables. But one thing that he mentioned that was interesting prominently is the character, the personality of the player, whether it fits that particular place. And he's in Philadelphia now. He was in Boston previously. He said, frankly, there were some players he just didn't sign for Boston. Same with Philadelphia. And he's got the right guys here in Philadelphia. Now, the predecessor, Matt Klintak, who kind of ran out of time, he had a lot of 500 records. Obviously, Gabe Kapler didn't work here, but he signed some guys who fit Philadelphia as well with Real Muto, tough guy. And, uh, you know, obviously Harper, fantastic signing for them. They had a kind of a Harper-Machado debate. And, and I think the owner, John Middleton, 
really leaned it toward Harper, and that was a very, very good decision. And uh, they signed Zach Wheeler, who obviously the, had been a Met. And, uh, you know, and then Dombrowski, when he came in, he brought in Schwarber. They had nobody on the roster with a World Series ring, with a winning World Series ring when he brought in Schwarber. And Schwarber is good, great for these moments. I think he's got the same number of home runs now as the Reggie Jackson in the postseason. Obviously, it's a different era, but still pretty impressive. Brought in uh, Trey Turner as well and uh, brought in Castellanos, who he knew from Detroit and who was kind of a tough guy. Uh, you know, I, I think feel is important. I think personality is important. And I think you have to look beyond the numbers. Yeah, I I I, I, I always go back to the word feel, John, um, uh, because everything is a tool. I, I think the problem is when we think when an analytics group thinks it's a Bible and not a tool. And what happens when you think it's a Bible and not a tool, and I quite frankly do think that happened in the has happened in the Bronx, is uh you you know, you see every issue the same way and you lose feel. There is, you know, you mentioned having a good feel for who plays in the Northeast, New York, Boston, and Dave Dombrowski. I don't know how the Yankees scout Joey Gallo, Carlos Rodon, and walk away and think these will be good fits in our marketplace. John, it really screams to looking at it in such a narrow, on-the-paper-only way, as opposed to being able to look at an issue from 20,000 feet. It just – it screams that they are not – that they are not – that they've lost field. Yeah, and you were absolutely right about Rodon, and we were at the winter meetings, and it was spirit. It was headed that way. I think we got that story on the plane heading back. Eventually, that Rodon had signed with the Yankees, uh, which was kind of an interesting story in itself. But at the winter meetings, before he had signed, when it appeared it was heading that way, you said Rodon didn't fit the Yankees. And I mean, you're not out in the field. I mean, you, to a degree, you are, but you're not paid to make those decisions. Uh, they should have asked you or a number of other people about Rodon. Now we will see. It's only one year for Rodon, but obviously Gallo was clearly not a fit. And I remember when he was uh, acquired from Texas, two of the people with Texas told me, I'm a little bit worried about uh, Gallo going to the Yankees. I wonder why the Yankees didn't have that feel. They just looked at analytics. And I mentioned it's a copycat league. I'm wondering now about Miami. Uh, seems to be going the other way toward more analytics you know they decided to favor the analytics guys and uh, basically let kim and go i mean they they picked up her option but didn't give her an extension after she had made the playoffs for the first time in 20 years in a full season in miami and uh, she made a lot of great decisions did a very good job she's the one who wanted skip schumacher that was the right call uh she's the one who liked the rise that was the right call um you know I, I'm not sure exactly why it might be easier to just look at the numbers and the analytics. And a lot of these guys are very wealthy guys who made money through stocks and different things like that. And maybe they feel that is the way to go, but it, it, it is funny how Miami seems to be going in the other direction. Yeah. Uh, you know, and besides everything else, I thought Kim brought uh, a professionalism that had really been lacking in that, right. uh, in that shop. Uh, she's dealing with, I believe, the smallest pro scouting department in the sport already. Uh, I I strongly believe that part of uh, the um, divorce uh, that came here with Kim not not accepting to pick up her side of the option was, I think, clearly she wanted an extension uh, of some of significance. She it. Uh, but I also think she wanted to expand her pro scouting group and she wasn't going to be able to do that to just get it even to less. She's never going to reach the size of the big markets, but can she get closer? Right. I mean, I understand it's significantly smaller than almost everybody else's. Uh, and she wanted to get rid of some people uh, in the, especially from the analytic wing of uh, the organization. And Bruce Sherman wouldn't go for that either. It, it's an interesting thing to be uh, in a trailblazing situation like Bruce Sherman, bring in the first female general manager. She has success, to your point. They hadn't made the right. playoffs in 162 game season since 2003. And then after that success, uh, not follow her path. And they wanted to hire somebody above her to be president yeah. of baseball operations. Seems crazy. kind of crazy. That one me. I don't God. get at all. I mean, to basically offer a demotion, you're, you're forcing her out, just like Houston did with James Click the year before after he'd won the World Series. Makes no sense to me. Now, Houston's still doing well. You're still covering them. They're still around. 
you know, we'll see how that goes. But he he's interviewing in Boston. But uh, with 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 uh, Kim, I mean, it's it just a crazy decision. I don't get it. Uh, you know, I don't think you're not related to uh, Bruce Sherman as you could. No, Sherman somehow, John, together. two Sh- two Sherman sport baseball teams uh, in Kansas. Yeah. In Miami, and I and I have no relationship whatsoever. Yeah, you're to, in the poor I, Germans. Yeah, you, you're, you're, you've known me for over three decades, John. Yeah. Money is not an area. Oh, well, I thought maybe a distant cousin or something like that. But you're, not, you're clearly in, not the, in under the poor that Germans. Stuff. That said, obviously he's been very successful, uh, and and actually uh, we, he's part of the success story with the Marlins right now. But you know, to me, this is really not even uh, something that can be explained how you would do this with Kim Ang, which was an obvious thing to give her an extension to me. Uh, yeah, she wanted things more collaborative. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, some of these analytics, not all of them, but some analytics people just look at the numbers and they think they're right 100% of the time. And in my, their mind, they can't be swayed and there's no discussion. And, you know, it seems like from what you gather, it was a little bit of a division that was divisive and not working out. And it maybe not as bad as it was when Denbo was there, but these are Denbo's guys. And, to, re- to reward them. I mean, I, I thought, are they going to survive? Denbo is out. She did win that battle. Uh, are these guys going to survive? And, you, you know, we're not there. We don't know how they did it, how they, I don't want to say, it was were ingratiated, but how they got in with the owner, uh, you know, seems crazy. I know we're talking a lot about Miami. When we're mostly New York uh, and national, well, but uh, it, it is shocking to, to us. Uh, she did a great job. But it does raise a question. Kim Ang is now out uh, in the marketplace. Um, the Mets, uh, su- as surprising as her getting in the marketplace, was the Mets uh, losing their uh, general manager, Billy Epler, resigning um, after uh, MLB let uh, him and uh, the Mets officials know that they were investigating him for uh, issues around uh, manipulation, uh, alleged manipulation of the uh, injured list. And there's an open job uh, in Boston. And I want to conflate the two, John, and see what you think about it, the Met job and the Red Sox job. David Stearns was a long, slow burn for Steve Cohn, who was very frustrated over the years that he couldn't get access to the people he wanted. There was a level of fear you know, I think built around Steve's reputation out of the hedge fund business, you know, Bob, the black edge book in particular was something that was used as a, 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 you know, guideline for a lot of people. And it took him really three years to hire who he wants. We're hearing very similar things out of Boston, that people are concerned about absentee ownership. You know, John Henry and his group are doing, you know, golfing stuff and soccer stuff and a lot, uh, you know, NASCAR and uh, that, their focus isn't this baseball team, which was it's the Fenway group as yeah. the center. And the other thing is a very, very powerful manager in Alex Cora, who's clearly going to have influence on who's hired and uh, have influence in player personnel. John, I said a lot there about that. Uh, there are two jobs. What 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 does it make you think about? Well, you know, with the Red Sox, uh, it's not only a thought or perception of absentee owner it owners it's i think that they fired guys you know dave dombrowski was a guy who was fired by them after winning a world series ben charrington another guy who was fired by them after winning the world series uh Chaim bloom was only there a few years um you know so you know i i think that plays into it to a degree now i think they are getting some good candidates in there thad levine who ended up not taking the philly job that did go to dave dombrowski uh, for personal reasons, I believe, I think he may uh, be interested in this job. I think, you know, it depends on how old your kids are and different things going on with your personal life. I think he will, they will get a good GM. I mean, you know, it's difficult. It's not easy. You know, it wasn't all Steve Cohn and it's a, t- it's difficult to fill this job. It is a 24 seven job. I mean, I know David Stearns has told people, you know, the only time he ever had off as GM was on Christmas, which is interesting because, He's Jewish. So he worked 364 days, had Christmas off. It's a difficult job. There aren't a lot of people who are willing to put their family life aside. They weren't able to get John Daniels from Texas. And obviously he's looking a bit better now with some of the draft choices, uh, doing very, very well there in Texas. And he would have been a good choice. Um, There are still guys out there, whether it be Josh Burns, James Click, who we mentioned earlier, uh, Levine. And I think they will get somebody. What? I, think, I think James Click actually, uh, citing family situations, pulled himself. Okay. Uh, uh, 
Well, you know, I, I do think that they, they will be able to get uh, somebody good there, whether it be Thad Levine or somebody else. Uh, but it, it is difficult to hire for that job. Yeah, you know, these jobs are all consuming. And one of the things I learned when I was covering this Met situation up close for multiple years was there are people in towns now. Think about how in demand, uh, you know, uh, 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 Antonetti and Chernoff have been in Cleveland. Like those guys don't want to leave Cleveland. There's right. a comfort level there. You know, your money goes further. You probably have to do a lot of bad baseball for a long time to lose your jobs. You know, uh, David Forst in Oakland, as bad as things have gotten, like he's had opportunities to get out of there. Mike Hazen just re-upped in Arizona. I think we think of New York, Boston, that these are the meccas. And I think they were at one time. I think there's just a lot of guys who have comfort and fear. Yeah. Well, it's and, the owner. if you have an owner that you like yeah. and a boss that you like, because that's the guy you're dealing with. That's the guy who really controls what you're in, you end up doing. So if you have a comfort level, as Mike Hazen obviously did in Arizona and the Cleveland guys and many of the others, Derek Falvey in Minnesota, um, you know, if you get along with your boss, uh, that's that's a big deal because that you're really your your situation depends on him. And yeah, I mean, New York is a tougher job. I mean, obviously, David Stearns went from Milwaukee to New York. He knows what he's getting himself into as a New Yorker. But, uh, you know, it's a much, much uh, more all-encompassing job. Uh, I don't think the media is necessarily as tough as it used to be, but it's still big in New York. It's still a lot of media, and uh, particularly compared to a Milwaukee or a Cleveland or Tampa even. I guess what I'm saying, though, John, is like it feels that there was a point pretty far into our careers that this was the destination that people were trying to get here or try to get to Boston. And it feels to me that that is no longer true. That, I mean, certainly there's still great jobs and people will take yeah. them, but the idea of it as the be all end all for every executive, as it works up the pyramid, I just don't think these marketplaces are the same anymore. Yeah. Could that be your perspective as someone who's been a lifelong New Yorker? It's my perspective reporting yeah. out that people were turning down the opportunity to interview here and interview in Boston. Well, that, it used that's to be true like now, but I, I don't oh. I don't think that it was ever the be all and end all that, that you see. But, uh, you know, you, you've lived your whole life here. I've moved around a lot. I'm more like Larry Brown, I guess, or whatever. Uh, you know, I, I never saw that as something. I think it's great to have a great life. You can have a great life anywhere. It doesn't have to be in New York or Boston or, or Philadelphia. I can only have a great life in Manhattan. I'm very, very yeah, prepared. Or Brooklyn. You were in Brooklyn for a little while. So you got out of the area code at least a little bit. Well, since we're talking about general managers, we're going to bring on one of the best. Uh, Alex Anthopoulos of the Braves joins us next on the show. John and I are joined by Alex Anthopoulos, the general manager of uh, the Atlanta Braves. Let's get all the good stuff out right away. Six years as the general manager, six NL East titles, uh, best record in the sport this year. Team tied the all-time home run record. Now for the downside, you're joining us. That means your team was uh, eliminated in the division series, Alex, by the Phillies again. And it, it raised all the questions about playoff format. Uh, you know, should there be reseeding afterwards? What does the rest but that you you get because you win a division while the wild cards keep playing? As somebody who's had to live this life the last two years, what do you think? Do you, we need to change this format? Yeah, and I've been asked that. I know it's been it's been a topic, and a few. I definitely have some thoughts on it. Um, my first thought is everyone knows the rules going in, right? All thirty teams, and if you told me. I'd rather not win the division, not get the bye, play an extra round with the risk of losing. I'd say no. And, you know, the other, so, you know, that's the first piece. The other part of it is, is just me. I don't think it's respectful to the Phillies. I mean, they're a good, just, it, it, it just, to me, those thoughts just, um, they bleed into, well, like you're, in, you're entitled to win because you won during the season or you won the division. Like how, how dare you lose in the first round? Like, well, there's another team on the other side that's, really well run and really talented and really good. And they did a phenomenal job and they're, they're talented and it's not your birthright to just advance because you had a good season. And, you know, I think, again, my view of it is I just, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of the conversation. I understand it. If players want to say it's a rhythm sport and time off. Sure. But I would, 
I would bet a lot that everybody uh, that got a buy would still want that buy. And look, it's on us to find a way to play better. But, um, you know, that's it. We got beat. The Phillies are awesome. They're a fantastic team. They're really well run. Um, even though we played them well during the year, I mean, they were always tough battles. Even in 22, I think, you know, they were, it's always been close. So they deserve to win. Layoff, no layoff, this, that, and the other thing. Um, they play better than us, period. Yeah, I mean, uh, you you looked better than the other 100-win teams, the Orioles and the Dodgers, who really played poorly for their uh, time in the playoffs. Uh, and you played a team that does seem to be red hot. And it did seem like you guys had taken care to prepare and make sure that you weren't rusty. Uh, but now looking back that it's the second time in a row that the Phillies have eliminated you in, in a little bit of an upset. And I agree, they're pretty good. Is there something else that you think you could have done differently? Yeah, I think, you know, look, it, it's normal and it's fair to say, well, it's two years in a row, it's the same team, right? So that's completely fair. And look, if you don't like it, win, right? Or, you know, don't be in this position. I remember when we got David Price in Toronto, he had a sign up above his locker. If you don't like it, pitch better, you know? And to me, if you don't like whatever people want to say, win, you know, get results. And that obviously starts with me. Um, but no, I think the years are totally different. Uh, I think last year, 22, Strider had the oblique. We tried to get him through three innings for two innings. He was great, but he was, he hadn't pitched in forever. Max Fried was not right. Um, and Charlie Morton wasn't having as, as good a year. Um, and look, and obviously the Phillies did really well, but we were in a different position. Uh, I, would, I look at these games, except for game three, that it was a really lopsided score, 10 to two, I believe. We were in all, all these games. We were in game one. We were in game four. We won game two. Obviously we came back late. Um, and from a runner's score position standpoint, you get a big hit here and there, those games change. Now, does that mean we win the series? I can't say that. But I do think, you know, we had four extra base hits in four games. Um, that's credit to the Phillies. We have so much power and so much slug on this team. I'd expect that, you know, to, to get more more than that. But runners to score position, the numbers were not good. And again, I think had we gotten a few timely hits, I think there's a very good chance we at least get to a game five. And then who knows? I mean, we still might lose. But I think the years, the years are different. Whereas I felt like last year, we just weren't in a lot. We won game two with Kyle Wright on the mound. He pitched exceptionally well. But the other games that we lost to the Phillies last year, I just felt like we were out of it. Was th this year, other than game three, where it was a lopsided score, we were in all those games in a base hit here and there, at a timely hit with runners in scoring position. It changes things. But look, I could do that the other way. If Mike Harris doesn't make the unbelievable catch on Nick Castellanos in game two, we potentially lose that game as well. So they didn't get the timely hit, you know, and that's a credit to our defense, but you know, Nick Castellanos hit the ball unbelievably well. So that's the postseason. That's the playoffs. It's, it was a four game set sample, um, but you can play the Phillies a hundred times. They're a great team period. You mentioned it. It's a four game uh, set. It's a four game sample. And the word crapshoot gets thrown around a lot this time of year. Alex, you have a lot of playoff experience. Toronto, when you were uh, with the Dodgers, and obviously now every year you've been with Atlanta. Are there things that can be done by the executive in your position to make a team more bulletproof for the playoffs? Or is it always just about getting in? I got to make the team as bulletproof for 162 games if possible. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Great question. Because I go back and forth on this all the time. And I, you know, every GM in sports will probably tell you the same thing. You should, you know, you at the end of the season, you always try to have a takeaway, whether you made the postseason or you didn't and so on. So every year we try to take something away from it. So at the end of 2020, we went to game seven of the NLCS against LA and lost. We had a three, one lead in the series. And I had certain takeaways from that, that moment of you know what we needed to do and what was important. At the end of 2019, we lost to the Cardinals. I had certain takeaways from that mo moment as well um and even after 22 and even now 23 i have certain takeaways um that being said you do i was so after 20 when we really lost a heartbreaking series to la up 3-1 game seven thought we had a very good chance to win a world series but we lost um you know i was so hell-bent on and really focused on what wins in the postseason exactly what you're talking about to where it really shaped our offseason going into 21. And to the expense of not, you know, we we lost our depth and we, 
we didn't keep our eye on the prize enough of you need to get in and you can't lose sight of the fact that we almost didn't get in. We weren't playing well for the first four months. We were under 500. We obviously added a lot of guys at the trade deadline, but we had a lot of injuries. We didn't have depth and you'd almost taken it for granted that we'd won the division in 18. We'd won the division 18, 19, 20, and every year felt like a progression. The win total went up that third year. We get to game seven of the CS and, you take it for granted, like, okay, we've got this making the playoffs thing down, but we can't get over the hump to get to the World Series. Let's just pay ultra attention to that. And I think it was a mistake. So I don't like to use the word crapshoot uh, because, look, these are good teams and you need to have a good team. And I do believe there are things that you need. Good starting pitching, good bullpen, obviously. Good offense, you know, power. Um, does that mean that you can have a fantastic starter that has a bad day? Sure. I think Max Fried's a phenomenal starter. Did he have his best starting game two? No, we won the game. I think Strider's a phenomenal starter. We lost game game one. I think we have great offense and great power. We had four extra base hits. Um, you know, so I think our, our I think our bullpen overall was good as well. So look, guys still need to play well. Um, things need to break your way, errors, bounces, things like that. Team makes a great play, just like Harris made a great play on Nick Castellanos. Trey Turner made an unbelievable play in game one on Albies. Ball was hit 104 up the middle. Unbelievable play where he turned turned to it. But he's, a, he's an incredible player. Great players make those plays. So, um, yes, in a small sample, things can happen. But I do think at the end of the day, you need to have a good roster. And I do believe, look, our job as a GM is you better still focus on being able to get there. Obviously, you're trying to increase your odds and your chances. Winning the division, get, giving yourself a buy playing a best of five instead of three. Those are all good things that should increase your odds. So I don't think I'll ever go back to the mindset of what wins in October. Let's focus everything on that. It's that that's too hard to do. I think you do what you can to try to get back to the playoffs, whether it's wild card to win the division and make sure, like you said, you're in a position where you're healthy and so on. And you have that you have what you deem is enough talent to win a world series. Yeah, I mean, you have a great team going forward, uh, drafting. You've been great, developing great, particularly locking guys up, and you have an incredible nucleus. I'm just looking at your offseason and what went on this year. Obviously, Wright has an injury concern. Uh, Freed's thing is, I believe, minor. Morton, you have an option on. You guys really have not delved too deeply. I mean, you've investigated the free agent market, but you've done pretty little in the free agent market. There are several pitchers out there uh, this year, uh, do you expect to be involved? And I'm, I'm just curious about this because Wheeler is from Atlanta and I, I think he did want to go there. Uh, you ended up not signing him and neither did the Mets, the team that had him. So maybe there was something more to it or I don't know, but any regrets on Wheeler and is there anything, um, you know, you're looking at in terms of the free agent starting pitching market, or do you feel like you have enough there? Yeah, so fair questions. You know, obviously anyone who's currently on a roster for somebody, we talked about a retired player or someone I can comment, right? Trade, signings, this and that. So I can't get into any of that kind of stuff. But what I can tell you is, and I don't remember the timing of all these signings and so on. Um, at the end of 2020, we definitely were short starters. We had Ian Anderson and Max Freed, and then we were piecing it together. We had AJ Minter as an opener in the postseason and so on. And we were aggressive that offseason. We signed Charlie Morton and we signed Drew Smiley that offseason. We signed two starters. <clears throat> we identified both guys, really wanted them. Uh, you know, and Charlie Morton became our one. If you look at that 2021 playoff run, Charlie Morton started game one of every series, even into game one of the World Series. That slotted Max Fried down to two, and that slotted Ian Anderson down to three. <clears throat> and then ultimately young guys like Kyle Wright and so on were able to take some of the load at, at the end towards the, the World Series. So – I'm because of these. What I like to say, you win a World Series every year. Of course, I mean no one has no one. At least in the six years I've been here, we've had a new World Series champion each year. So, um, the fact that we won in 21, it's hard to have any regrets from there. I think every year that you don't win, you know. So starting in, so I would look back now that we won in 21, look back and say, well, what could we have done going into 22? We won 101 one games. The, the Braves hadn't done that in over 20 years. I hadn't done that as a GM, so that felt like a great year, but we lost in the first round. I would have told you, and I did say this last offseason, I'm like, it's unlikely we're going to win 100 games again just because it's hard to do that. And as good an organization as the Braves have been, they hadn't done that in 20 years. So that doesn't mean you can't win a World Series. 
And then we go out this year and win 104. And I didn't think there'd be a scenario we can get better, but our guys had phenomenal years. And then you still lose in the in the first round. So I think from my standpoint, uh, if you look back, I mean, you always look back regardless. Uh, but once it ends in a World Series, whatever you're, you're thinking about, well, it worked out, so you don't overanalyze that too much, other than you want to keep the train going. I think after 22, you look back and say, well, could we have gotten anyone at the trade deadline that would have made an impact? Could we have got anybody in that 21 off season uh, that would have helped us in 22? And now in the same vein, I'd say in 23, what could we have done last off season or trade deadline? So, I mean, that's part of the process that we're going through now. Um, I don't have anything for you yet, but I mean, I think almost anybody in sports will tell you, I look back all the time, draft signings, trades. That's how you get better. Alex, uh, John, John mentioned a name. You, you, in the short term, when it comes to pitching, right now, I think you have Strider, Freed, Elder as kind of like obvious uh, for your yeah. rotation next year. I believe Charlie Morton has a twenty million dollar option. Yes. Uh, do you know? A, does he want to play in twenty twenty four? And if he does, do you think it's going to be with the Atlanta Braves? Yeah. So we have a few guys with options: Charlie, Kirby Yates, Colin McHugh, Eddie Rosario believe those are the four off the top of my head. Um, so, and obviously we just got eliminated. Um, those are all, that's part of putting together the planning, the roster, this and that. We have to make those decisions within five days of the World Series. Um, none of those decisions have been made. None of those conversations have been had. Um, we, it's just so early in the process, right? So obviously it's not to dodge the question. We, we, we have not made any decisions and so on. I haven't had conversations. It's still so fresh. I haven't touched base with players. As I go through things for off season, I'll touch base with some guys. And so, you know, now you get bogged down in some administrative things, you get eliminated early. There's a lot of staffing and things like that. You got it. You have to get done. But look, obviously in the next two weeks, we'll make some of those determinations. I will say this. You asked about Charlie specifically. We love Charlie. He had a phenomenal year for us. Look, he got injured at, at, at the end, but he is such a stabilizing force in our clubhouse on the mound. Uh, we were confident he was going to have a better year in 23 than he did in 22. That that ended up playing out. I mean, we thought his home run rate was inflated in 22, and that would come back down to where he's been. Look, his velocity and his stuff is still phenomenal. So, um, you know, but beyond, I don't think it's fair to talk about him and the other guys that have options. But we had a really good team, and all those guys I mentioned with options were a big part of contributing to that. So, like anything else, we have to figure out the roster going forward, holes, needs, and that'll happen over at least the next two weeks for that group and obviously into, into November and likely December as well. And Joe mentioned the rotation of certainties, and it's not, not a long list at the moment. So I, I do want to follow up about the uh, free agent market. Uh, overall, the free agent market isn't spectacular, but in, for starting pitching, it's pretty good between Yamamoto, Snell, Nola, Gray, Montgomery probably Eduardo Rodriguez. Uh, you guys have not signed a ton of free agents. I think last year you signed one free agent for about a million dollars. You do have a, uh, you do work for a public uh, company and you have a tight budget. You've been able to win like that without a lot of free agency. Uh, do you expect to be in that free agent market uh, this year? Yeah, I'd say, look, it's, it's just, it's too early to know what we're going to do. I will say this though. So, you know, people want to talk about payroll and so on. Um, are we going to be first? No. Uh, but our payroll has grown. I mean, <clears throat> I think when I first got here, it's, our payroll has grown quite a bit. Uh, when I got here in 2018, I think we were probably 21st, 22nd in payroll, right right in that range, in the low 20s. Now we're into the top 10. I don't know if that's eight or nine. I, I haven't looked at the end of year uh, payrolls. I've always been given the funds at the trade deadline. If there's a player, we've added payroll every trade deadline I've been here. I've never been told no. Um, you know, normally when deals don't get made, it's because you're sending young, young talent out the door and so on. And look, we've, we've obviously signed some free agents as well. We signed Will Smith, gave up a draft pick, gave him a three, a, a three-year deal. We've obviously extended a lot of our own players and done some significant deals. Austin Riley got the biggest contract in the history of the Braves at over $200 million. Um, but like anything else, we're trying to fill a roster of 26. So, um, We've made a lot of commitments. We've made a lot of signings. We have a lot of guaranteed money on, on the books. Um, and that's certainly going to have an impact on things. But look, at, at the same time, we're, we're in a window to win right now. We have a very good team, very competitive team. Um, we obviously have ownership that's very committed to continue to try to get back to a World Series for one and win a World Series. So, but, you know, we don't have off-season plans yet. We don't 
I mean, like anything else, there's a lot of our position players are locked up. There's not a lot of spots there. Like you guys mentioned, we have a club option on, on, on Eddie Rosario for left field. So that's the decision we'll have to make. The other spots, position player wise, are all set. Darno, Murphy, Olsen, Riley, Albies, Arcia, Cunha, Harris. I mean, those those guys are going to be here. Those are the expectation. In the rotation, just like you said, we've got three guys right now that are under contract, under control, and we have to make decisions on others. And we have to make some, some decisions in the bullpen as well. So um, obviously we have to feel the roster when when it, when it comes time for opening day. But it's, you know, we both, all, all three of us know the winner is so long. And I think who knows with trades what's going to happen. Yeah, you know, just to stick with the starting rotation, I uh, would strongly assume you're not going to give us a great answer on this, but I believe Max Fried is a free agent uh, after next season. Am I right about that? Correct. He's got one year of club control. So, yeah, and and you mentioned all the players you do have under control. Uh, essentially, your entire position group, uh, the good, the the really good players. The one guy, Strider, also from your rotation. The one guy who's been special and generally homegrown. I know he's originally San Diego, who you haven't is freed. I have to assume that you've made attempts to do this. At this point, should we assume he's going to get out into free agency after next year and you'll just ride this wave because he's been your ace these last few years? Yeah, and, and obviously I've been asked about Max. One, he's second in Cy Young a year ago, one of our best starters, one of the best starters in the game. Um, and as as we all know, as guys get closer to free agency, I'm going to get asked these questions, right? That's just the nature. So I get it. Um, I will say this. People always ask, you know, have you, and I know you guys get the same stock answer. Don't want to talk about negotiations, this and that. So I'd give you the same one, but I, I do want to try to vary the answer a little bit. You know, the reason, I, I think there's a lot of reasons why, you know, one that's not productive to ever get into that is one, if there have been conversations or not, you know, th those are obviously private. I think it becomes a distraction to the player. I don't have to be down in that clubhouse each day. Right. But players are at a locker every day and they have to get asked about it all the time and this and that. So I think it's out of respect to all sides um, to keep it private at, at the end of the day. And look, everyone will tell you the same thing. Every GM will tell you when they have a great player who's approaching free agency and they're getting asked about it. Everyone will say, we love that player. We'd love to have that player. here." Of course, who wouldn't? Which GM doesn't want a great person and a great player? Um, that being said, you know, we've historically since I've been here, you know, the goal is that if deals get done, the first anyone hears about it is you get a release from the Braves, ideally. other Rather than John Heyman or Joel Sherman being able to break the news, we're hoping that we're putting out a release. So um, like anything else, and I'd say this for any of our elite level players, of course we want to keep all those guys here. Um, you know, beyond that, that's just a private conversation. I'm going to go off the board here, but I know you can handle this. The uh, Attaboy Harper uh, situation that happened in the playoffs I think the journalistic aspect of that has been hashed out and it's been determined by all of us journalists that the journalist who reported the Attaboy Harper, and by the way, about the 20th paragraph, so he didn't try to make too big a deal out of it, uh, was correct. If someone's shouting something in the middle of a clubhouse in that small frame of time where the reporters are actually in the clubhouse, it is fair game. Um, you, you may disagree if you want or not just avoid the journalistic aspect altogether, but what did you think of the uh, the whole thing? Uh, I mean, obviously, you made the right decision to uh, have Arcia be the starter, which was a surprise. He became an all-star. He was very good. I don't want to harp on this and make this be all about him. But, you know, uh, was that a mistake? Did he, should he not have said something? I mean, Harper then ended up hitting two home runs. He might have hit two home runs anyway. Uh, you know, was it a negative thing in the playoffs or was it just something that happened that was interesting at that moment? Yeah, so look, obviously you'd have to be living under a rock to not see what was going on, right? It was everywhere. That it was debated amongst media and this and that. So I saw it. I followed it all. Uh, I learned some stuff. I don't know the first thing about that role and that job and what's fair game and not and appropriate. And I, you know, I heard both sides of the argument. And this is not my Canadian answer. I'm going to be in the middle and not get involved. But I actually do believe this. I think all that stuff, in my opinion, is noise. And that's not to say it's right, wrong, or indifferent is I think once guys step on the field, that stuff's gone anyways. I don't think it affects someone at the plate. I don't think it affects someone on the mound. I think it's a distraction and it's noise. And look, ideally, um, as a club, you like as minimal minimal distractions as you can, minimal noise. But look, you're in the postseason. All eyes are on you. That goes without saying. You're going out to the field. You're going to have fans, crowds, all that kind of stuff. So um, 
that's why I just, I refuse to buy into any other narratives of layoffs or this or that. At the end of the day, two teams went out on the field at whenever the first pitch was. And I don't believe that once they're on the field, these guys are professionals. They've done it a ton. I don't think anything, I don't think anyone's thinking about any of that other stuff. And that stuff is all off the field. And I don't think it affects, and take a Bryce Harper. That guy's a Hall of Famer, MVP candidate. Um, I mean, he's, He's a, whether there's distractions or not, you're game planning for that guy anyway. He's an elite superstar player. So um, I just think to me, it's all excuses, you know, and that's not do dodging it. I just like, I think it's a, from a club perspective, anytime we spend even thinking or worrying about this stuff, it's not productive. Alex, I have so many thoughts on it. Uh, our time is short, so I don't want to <laughs> go into it. I think I'm 98% with you that it's noise. You know, if Harper strikes out four times that night, what, whatever. The right. back catcher for the Phillies in the postgame clubhouse afterwards is screaming like blank the Braves and certainly <laughs> blank the Mets, no, right? I, I so it. like if the Mets go 13-0 and against the <laughs> Phillies next year, are we going to say the backup catcher of the Phillies riled up the Mets to go 13-0? and <laughs> So I'll, I'll end it with this because John and I do a segment before we have our guest on. And we talked about, you know, that there are GM openings. And we also talked about that there is a possibility where we're heading for maybe this postseason is very old style managers, Bochi and Thompson, very old style, maybe front office guys in um, uh, Dave Dombrowski and Chris Young. And after 20 plus years after Moneyball, we're still having this discussion about the meaning of metrics and when to use them, the meaning of uh, eyeball scouting and when to use them. I don't know what my question is, except for that I know you're thoughtful on this, and it's going to be a subject over the next few weeks until our season is done. I guess the question would be, what do you think about it all 20 plus years after Moneyball, and what piece do you have about how you make decisions? Yeah, so a few things. So your first part about guys saying stuff in clubhouses and this and that, and I go back to my David Price quote. If you don't like it, pitch better. If you don't like it, hit better. You know, like, you win, you lose, like, that stuff is people get to celebrate, you know, Bryce Elder to me, you know, you guys obviously New York guys, um, when Alonzo, he gave up, the, he gave up, you know, Bryce Elder gave up a big home run to Alonzo and Alonzo was yelling, throw it again. And someone asked Bryce Elder about it. And he said, you know what, if I hit a ball 500 feet, I'm allowed to say that too. Like he was totally fine with it, you know? And I think that's accountability, you know? So I just don't believe in feelings, getting hurt and all that kind of stuff. We're competing. People should have a right to be happy to c celebrate it. That's the nature. It's not malicious. And, you know, I'm fine with it. I have zero issues there. Um, you know, in terms of old school, new school, all that kind of stuff, look, this has been debated forever, right? Analytics, money ball, all this stuff, you hear about it. I mean, I, you know, my view on this is, like, Dave Dombrowski has been a very successful executive for a long time. You know, I've said this for a long time. And I, look, I remember as a young fan of the Montreal Expos going to Expos games. Dave Dombrowski is the GM of the Miami Marlins, Florida Marlins at the time. And he'd sit in the scout seats. I don't know if he still does it today, but I remember like talking to my buddy, like, oh my, I was more enamored with the GM than I was the star player. And that was the celebrity for me. And I remember saying, wow, that's Dave Dombrowski sitting in the scout seats. Like, I'd love to go over and, and say hi. And uh, I, I finally got the courage to go up to him and say hi to him. And I was looking for an excuse to bring up a topic. And I asked him when when the second baseman they had, Kilby Overas, was going to come back off the DL at the time. I <laughs> so uh, I still remember him, though. He Good was question. so nice. Yeah, I just oh, I was like, I didn't want to just go say hi. But he was great. But you look at what he did from the Expos to – and you look at what the, the Detroit team that he took over. I mean, and no disrespect to Detroit by any stretch, but they were not a very good team at that time. And they brought in, obviously – you know, his owner, Mike Gillich, committed a lot of funds and so on, but he brought in phenomenal star players. He made it a destination place to play. And he didn't do it for three years and it was over. I think he was there 14 years. Like, the life cycle of a player, assuming they just go through the system, is six years, seven years, whatever it might be. I mean, he continued to have long, sustained success. And then he ends up with the Red Sox. And same thing, has success as well. So, um, it's a Hall of Fame executive. Now it's all, and you know, age is irrelevant to me. And this guy was, he was a great GM when he was young, great GM now. I mean, he hasn't, you know, it's, he's, he's an elite GM. Guys, like the guys you talked about, Baker, Bochi, and so on. 
Those guys have always been good. Sure, we're going to go through dips and valleys with rosters and so on. But I just I don't get so caught up in age or I mean, if you're good, you're good. And you could be good young. Theo Epstein was amazing at 28. Right. And you could be good as an older executive, an older manager as well. So I, I never got caught up in that stuff. Um, I look at Chris Young. I don't know him well, but I've gotten to know him. And, you know, from afar, he was ultra aggressive, making his team better at the trade deadline. He kept pushing and pushing and doing things. And, you know, they deserve all the success they're, they're, they're having now as well. But, I mean, no one consistently has success every single year. You're going to have bumps in the road. But I, I just don't view it as – I just never looked at it as, well, you're new school, you're old school. I think you stand on your own two feet. And if you're good, you're, you're good, no matter what your upbringing was or your age. Well, I'm going to say you're very good, Alex Anthopoulos. As I mentioned <laughs> at the top, Six for six. Uh, I know it's a tough moment, but this was a great year for the Atlanta Braves. Uh, you you had had a rally the two previous years, but this one you were pretty much wire to wire, the best team in the NL East and the best team in the National League. And I know it's a, a you know a downtime for you. So John and I do appreciate you joining us on the show. Glad to be on, guys. Really appreciate the kind kind words. We thank Alex Anthopoulos for uh, joining our two-timer club. Uh, a growing list, uh, second time as a guest, and uh, we appreciated uh, Alex joining us. John, um, midway through the ALCS, NLCS here, hit or error? You know, I'm going to give my hit to uh, Chris Young, the general manager of the Texas Rangers. He's obviously doing a, a terrific job. I mean, it's interesting. He's like other GMs, and then he did go to an Ivy League school, Princeton, but unlike most uh, other GMs, he played the game. He was actually a, a pretty good major league pitcher for the Mets and other teams, won a World Series with the Royals. And, uh, you know, he's done a great job, and he's shown that you can win through free agency, as Dave Dombrowski has as well. Uh, the choice of Marcus Semien and Corey Seager uh, early, uh, a, a year ago, uh, started it, and those were great, great decisions. Marcus Semien is a guy who plays every single game, and he plays hard every game. And he's a great defensive second baseman after starting as a shortstop. And Corey Seager is just one of the best, probably three hitters in the game. And, uh, you know, obviously the Dodgers still have a great team. They've lost a lot of great players too. And that's one. And they lost to Chris Young. And uh, and uh, he's just doing a, a terrific job. At the off-day workout, John, I had a long conversation with Chris Young about the durability of Marcus Simeon just yesterday because uh, it's so impressive. Uh, one of the uh, few guys to play all 162 games this year, and he does that with some frequency. John, I'm going to uh, also pick out somebody we've talked about a little bit in this show for a hit. Uh, I'm going to pick out Rob Thompson. Uh, I think anyone who knows Rob is happy what's happened the last two years, because in a way it feels like a great gift, especially for him. He was seemed to always was going to be a lieutenant and never a general, and people loved him as a lieutenant because – he was a hard worker. He was good at it. He kept his head down. He didn't seek uh, attention. He just did a good job, especially in all those years for the Yankees. The Yankees kind of went a different direction uh, when they went from Joe Girardi uh, and they went to Aaron Boone, who's had a good deal of success in New York. When Joe Girardi was out in Philadelphia, though, they went to Rob Thompson yeah. and Rob has shown that he isn't a lieutenant, that he can handle being the general and to know Rob Thompson is to like him. And I think people are around the sport. It would be hard to find somebody who dislikes him. So I think it would be very hard to find someone who isn't happy for him right now. Yeah, absolutely. Great guy. And I know this has become like the Dave Dombrowski show, but Dombrowski made that choice. And, you know, he's good at judging character and persona. And Rob is fantastic for a team. And it's a team with a lot of stars. And you have to figure some egos, and he's done amazing with that. And no matter what he does at this moment, it's turning to gold. I frankly haven't gotten a great explanation why Nick Castellanos, their second best hitter, about seventh, but he must be right because it's working fabulously. Yeah, it's hard to second guess at this point. You know, no, two, two, two cracks, two cracks at this. He won the NL pennant last year. It looks like he's probably on the way to doing at least that uh, again this year. 
We'll obviously keep exploring all that. Probably when we do our show next week, it will be some version of a World Series preview, John. You know, this is the show, a podcast from the New York Post. We always appreciate all the work that Jake Brown and Andrew Hartz do in producing this show. Uh, don't forget, this show drops on the Yes app it, this week because we're doing the show on Wednesday. It will be on Thursday at about noon. Please uh, give it a view. Uh, subscribe, rate, review the show on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcast and continue to stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman.